I want to start off with a story about an art gallery that I used to run out in California. Hi. Um, the art gallery had all kinds of different people that collected art, right? They would come in and buy artwork. They would come in and some people would spend $3,000 on a piece of artwork and it's their very first piece and it was a really, really big deal for them to spend $3,000. We had other clients that would purchase a million dollars worth of artwork and fill up a 13,000 square foot house and this will be their fifth house that they've done. So we had a lot of different people buying art for a lot of different reasons, but they all had one thing in common. None of them considered themselves to be art collectors. They all just loved art. They liked to go in places, find something that they fell in love with, and take it home with them. But they were not a collector, because art collectors are other people. They're people that are much smarter, they know stuff about art, they probably know the value of artwork, they know a bunch of stuff about artists, and they're probably buying art for some sort of strategic reason, and there are all these reasons that they weren't art collectors. Even if they had a whole house full of artwork, they weren't art collectors, because those are other people. That's kind of the way that I feel about the term activist. So I think in the room we're all pretty comfortable with the term advocate. Who here feels like they're an advocate for something? Raise your hand. We got good advocates. Who here considers themselves an activist? Great, one, two, maybe three activists in the room. So I've always been comfortable with the term advocate. I've advocated for sustainable communities. I've advocated for bicycle lanes. I've advocated for education in the arts. I've advocated for sustainable buildings. I think that I became an activist, like the word activist was used towards me when I lived through this. So in Alabama, we were hit by 67 tornadoes in one day. That's a lot of tornadoes. I don't know if you've ever had the entire system that you depend on taken out from under you, all communications down, people don't know how to connect with one another. And I took this photograph. This is very typical for what happened all over the state of Alabama. So when every system that you have in place is gone, what do you do? You just start doing, right? People just come out and they try to figure out like, what can I do? I want to help, this is terrible. Look, everyone's lost everything. My house was not damaged, so I was one of the people with the ability to start doing. And when I transformed my thinking into an activist, it means that it just freed me up to not worry about stepping on toes and what the system in place was and who's supposed to be doing what because the Red Cross headquarters, it was in with this. The city halls and the town squares throughout the state, they all look like this. All of the people that we rely on to do stuff for us in government, they have their own things to worry about. So we had to start doing for ourselves. It was pretty freeing. So this is a, a donation supply drive that I organized because it turns out you just start doing. I called some people. I knew a guy with a truck. I knew a guy that owned the shopping center where Home Depot was. He said, sure, you can set up. So we just went and started doing. And it's a dangerous place to be a doer, right? So the police show up and they say, who gave you permission to be here? And I said, the guy that owns the property gave me permission. And they say, but who gave you permission to collect building supplies? No one. There is no one else to do it. We have to patch roofs. We have to fix windows. We need this done now. I'm doing it because it needs to be done. It took a whole lot of police to surround two people that were gathering up building supplies to finally run it all the way up and figure out it was okay for us to do that, right? We weren't breaking any laws, we were just doing. And then this is me down here at the corner running a workshop with high school students to figure out how they wanted their neighborhood to be because no one else was engaging the high school students, right? It's all the adults in the room figuring out what they want their community to be when it builds back. And I kept saying, gosh, somebody else should really engage the students. Somebody needs to engage the young people. Somebody, somebody. And my sister said, why don't you do it? That's kind of your thing, right? You're, you're a school teacher. You've done that. You know how to work with kids. And it never occurs to me, no matter how many times I do it, I still fall back into thinking someone else who's smarter needs to be doing this stuff. I'm not the expert, right? That would be crazy. It's a sad time when you know you come out and you're like, wow, turns out I'm the one that's going to have to fix this. That feels like a heavy burden. 
So the way that this connects to resilience is the antithesis of resilience is sitting around waiting for someone else to fix something. So activism, getting up and just doing it, whether the system is in place or not, whether the system is with you or it isn't, activism is really at the heart of resilience, right? When you're just like, you know what? Something needs to be done and I guess I'm gonna be the one to do it. So we've all heard this definition of resilience. I don't know if we've all heard it. I've heard it a lot and it confuses me every time I hear it. Resilience is the capacity of individuals and systems to survive and adapt and grow in the face of stresses and shocks. Resilience is about making communities and systems better prepared and they're able to bounce back more quickly. And I think, what does that mean? I mean, philosophically, that sounds great. How do I know if I've achieved this, what do I do to go out and make this happen? It's really confusing, and I've been working in resilience for a decade. But when I hear the word described like this, it doesn't make any sense. So I felt like, what does this mean to me? What makes a person, or a neighborhood, or a place resilient? When the system is totally broken down, when you're left with nothing, no government, no structure, no system, when it's unable or unwilling to function properly, it's our individual ability to take care of ourselves and each other. That's what it drills down to. It's your ability to just stand up and say, you know what, I, I am the activist. I'm gonna start doing it, I'm gonna start fixing it. The system doesn't work with you. The system is an obstacle. Go around it, just do. So this is a lot about um, where, well, where we are in our minds, right? Why does almost everybody in the room think that they're an advocate, but only two or three people think they're activists? And what I want to achieve today is for you to, in your mind, think that, you know what, I am the activist. Turns out I, I can be the doer. Because the only thing that's stopping us is the belief that someone else is better equipped to fix whatever it is than us. There's somebody smarter, there's somebody that's got more training in this, there's somebody that's got more time to devote to it, because I spend three hours on Facebook, so I got a full schedule, you know, I gotta take care of my kids, I got a lot of stuff to do. I don't have time to be an activist, and I'm certainly not equipped to be one, because I'm just a normal, regular person. And normal, regular people don't do stuff like that. They don't change the world. It's really super special people do that, and that's certainly not me. So I want to talk about two activists that were just normal people. The first one is a woman who I saw on television. I was out in California when um, Katrina hit. And I felt like a lot of people that weren't living in Louisiana at the time or in Mississippi or in the Gulf Coast region, I felt very helpless. What can I do? What skills do I have to be able to go down there and help people that have lost everything? They're, they're, people are they're dead. There's dead people in the streets. Like, what do you, where do you even start? Helping. And there was a woman that came on TV and she was being interviewed and she had gone down there and she was painting fingernails. This is the Superdome. This is people living for days in the Superdome. And she went down there with her nail kit and she was painting kids' fingernails. And they, the news anchor was like, why? These people have lost everything. I think they got bigger problems than needing their nails done. And she said, you know, I was sitting at home in, you know, Tennessee, and I saw this terrible thing happen and I thought, oh my gosh, I gotta go help those people. And I don't know how to do anything other than paint fingernails. So I grabbed my kit and I went down and I set up and I started painting kids' fingernails. And she was like, and what I, they were like, that, that seems so ridiculous. And she said, what I know is that for the kids whose nails I've painted, they are able to escape out of this for 10 minutes or 20 minutes or an hour they're running around showing everybody their pretty fingernails, and they are so excited about it. And I don't know how to do anything else. Like, this is what I do, and she made a difference. So that's just one normal woman that just took her nail kit down to Katrina, set up in the Superdome, nobody giving her permission, right? Well, who, who, who gave her permission to do that? The other woman who I've had the great pleasure to meet, her name's Jody Williams. She is one of the seven living female Nobel Peace Prize winners. And Jody Williams is from a town of about 1,600 people in Vermont. She's a tiny little town. And she says all the time, like, I, there is nothing that makes me special. The only thing, if anything, does make me special, it's just my willingness to, like, dig in and change things. And she committed her life to 
getting rid of landmines because she saw an injustice in the world. Children and women and people working in the field were blowing up because of landmines that were left from, you know, decades and decades and decades ago. So she organized, started a nonprofit, she joined together, now there's 90 NGOs around the world working, they dismantled millions of landmines, she is a Nobel Peace Prize winner, and she's like, you know, I'm just a normal person, and she says, everybody must get up and do something. That's all I did, I just woke up, saw an injustice, and started doing. And now she's constantly like, ah, it's not enough, it's never enough. And once you become an activist and you start seeing yourself as that, it's never gonna be enough. So, now you're like, hey, you know what? That's cool, Laura. I dig it. I feel like I got an inner activist that I'm willing to let loose a little bit. So you're ready. How do you become an activist? Like, where do you even start? Because the problems are like so big and so insurmountable. Well, it's actually pretty easy, turns out. You have to figure out what do you want to change. And it doesn't have to be related to your job. There are things I'm certain that you think about in your neighborhood even if you're a planner, or you're an architect, or you're somebody that works within a governmental system, there's probably things in your regular life you're like, man, I just don't think I can impact change. Well, first figure out what it is that you want to change, and then figure out if that's really the thing that needs to be changed, right? Ground truth it. We're going to give you a tool that's going to help you figure out what the thing is that you need to change. And then collaborate with others, because I guarantee you, no matter what you're angry or upset or frustrated with, there are other people that feel that same way. Last night after the Pecha Kuchas, I went to a bar next door and I was talking to a couple of people, just random people, and they were like, why are you in town? And they were passing through and we started chatting. And the guy ended up telling me where he lives, he is really frustrated with where he lives, there's a lake, and he was like, by the way, this is a champagne problem, but like my slough that I live on, they need to dredge it, and the boats can't get in. I was like, hey, champagne problems, but you know what, for him, this is a frustration. And I said, how many people live on your street that feel the same way? And he was like, well, there's like 15 houses. And I said, and how many sloughs are there on the whole lake? And he was like, 50? And I was like, that's a lot of people that are probably frustrated. If you guys got organized, and he was like, ooh, organized, that sounds like something somebody else should do. And I said, here's the great thing. I bet if you just met with your neighbors, you may not be willing to be the one that's going to do this. But I bet you, out of all those people, there's somebody that's like, hey, I love organizing things. I love getting behind this. Yes, this is my mission. This is what I'm going to change. We all have something. So collaborating with others is the best way to get stuff done. So today, we're going to give you some tools that help you figure out ways that you can unleash that inner activist. Find resilience through being the doer. The first person that I'm going to have come up and speak with you, her name is Prisca Waynes. And I'm not going to give a traditional, like, Prisca's done all these fancy things, which she has. But I met Prisca a couple of years ago when I was working with the New York City Housing Authority. I plop down after disasters like Sandy, and I find the gaps where people have blinders on and they're missing something. So the New York City Housing Authority was like, hey, we're going to harden all our buildings, and we're going to put all these generators up on top of them, and you know, we're still going to have all these poor people living in the flood zone, but let's go talk about that. What did we miss? And I said, well, what about your outdoor spaces? Because they're going to harden the buildings with one point two billion dollars worth of money. Harden the buildings. And I said, what about the outdoor spaces in New York City? Um, no, hadn't thought of that. No stormwater management, no reconfiguring the outdoor, outdoor spaces to be better for people to actually live in. So I called up all the smartest people that I know and I asked them for a list of names of all the smart people that they know because I'm all about collaborating. And Prisca's name was one of the ones that came up, and she's from down in New Orleans, and she's one of the preeminent minds in stormwater management, amongst many other things in being a good human. And she's going to talk to you guys about a tool that helps you aggregate data in order to set priorities. Because once you've figured out the thing that you want to change, you need to be able to, there's probably a lot of things, and you need to figure out how to spend your finite resources and get set a priority list, because there's a lot to be done. 